It's now clear to a lot of people that AI is going to change things in a dramatic way. It will change jobs, companies, products, economies. But a lot of people were caught by surprise. People who weren't paying attention to AI as much in the last few years are now trying to catch up very quickly and to try to figure out, okay, where is this change leading us? This is a question I've been thinking about for a long time, specifically from the economic side, which is to say, okay, we are creating these amazing models. They can be used practically to create new kinds of products, but also improvements in existing products. But where does that shift value? The example I give to people is that when you heard the iPhone was released and you owned a taxi company, could you have foreseen the change that that the release of the iPhone and then everybody owning a smartphone and then people having internet on their smartphones and then companies like Uber are able to come around um, and then that whole cycle in eight years sort of being uh, a change to the taxi company industry all around the world, not just in one country. That change sort of indicates where how value shifted because of new technology changed uh, what is valuable in this in this new type of economy. And so we're, we keep learning new things about how AI shifts this. And in this video, I'll be sharing four main points or observations about this new generation of AI models and how they're sort of changing products and where is the value in sort of what is the layers of, of, of value in the technology stack. Um, and if you're building a new company that relies on AI, what kinds of things that can you can you build that are really protective as a competitive advantage for your company so it can't be copied easily by somebody else? This video follows a write-up that I posted um, to the Cohere blog called AI is eating the world. Now, to begin with, the title is a reference to a quote from about 11, 12 years ago by Mark Andreessen, who said, software is eating the world. And this is the phrase that a lot of tech uh, startups are built on and you know the venture capital ecosystem is, is built on, which is to say that technology is eating every other industry. If you look 30 years ago, there were maybe two companies uh, in the top public companies in the US, right? You had Intel and Microsoft. But if you look now, every company has to be a technology company. And the top five or six companies are all completely tech companies. So technology is growing out from just being an industry by itself to car companies have to be technology companies. They have no other. In retail, if you're not competing with Amazon on technology and e-commerce, then you can't be in retail. That is very difficult for you to compete if you don't have that tech component. And so that's the big um, shift that was happening over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, which is to say software is eating the world. And then this new development is for us to, to see how AI is sort of slowly but surely sort of building new capabilities that extend what software is able to do. And that sort of forces a new reality that we should you know, take a step back and, and think through what have you learned so far and have a, a sense of, okay, what have we learned now? And then this will continue to develop and we'll continue to learn about, about how these industries will, uh, will evolve in the future. Now, the first point here, and this continues from the previous video where I shared four points about the generative AI, this continues the list. And so the first point we start with here is number five, which is to say, okay, there are a lot of these maps or, or landscapes of AI technology and value stacks. Uh, so these are visualizations created by a number of analysts or venture capital funds to sort of try to make sense of, okay, there are 200, 300, 1,000 AI companies, what are they doing? How do they compare to each other? And the kind that I feel is probably the best first access to think about when comparing or looking at the tech stack is to say, okay, we have a layer of applications, and then we have a layer for models, and then we have a layer for cloud platforms where the model providers are sort of relying on. And each of these sort of relies on, on the layer below it. And there are specific companies in, in each of these layers. And this also is sort of can be seen in this visual from uh, another VC and recent Horowitz 
um, A16Z, which also sort of explains a little bit of nuance uh, about closed source or proprietary models versus open source uh, models and then model hubs. But the central point here is this vertical axis where you have applications, models, cloud platforms, and then you, if you want to go to the hardware la layer, which is at the moment NVIDIA basically, and you know some newcomers to, to the field, but there's you know very strong dominance there. This is a way to look at that stack. One thing that I feel should probably be added to a visual like this is that there's this layer of data and ML ops that lives under the models. And this contains companies that are part of this economy. So companies that come to mind are companies like Surge or Snorkel or Weights and Biases or Scale that help on either data or ML ops or both, uh, and a lot of other companies, but these are you know some of the ones that I've, I've, I've come across myself. And so that you can take a figure like this and then fill it up with logos and that will give you some map of you know how the industry is and who relies on, on other players and how, pe how these players compare to each other. Now, one very important point here is to say, let's not, if you're thinking about companies, don't think only about the technology factors. While it's very easy to focus on the models layer, but not sort of pay attention to how valuable the data is. Even more important, I would argue, is the business factors. So companies that have good distribution or proprietary data or domain expertise. So these are not software, so that's not part of the tech stack, but these are very important components to think about when you're considering a competitive advantage or, or a protective moat uh, for a company or a product that you're building. I quote some examples in the article here of how uh, Lensa AI, for example, you know, got a million in revenue in, in December just by having uh, established distribution. And so the business factors are just as important, if not even more important sometimes than the, the technology stack. So a, a fuller picture contains both. Point number six is for enterprises or large companies that are still sort of building their strategy of okay, there are these big models now, how can we incorporate them? One thing that I would advise is to think not of just one use case or 10 use cases, but really plan on thousands of touch points across your systems with AI. Some companies have, all, have been on this road for, for a long, long time, and Google is, is, is one of them, for example. So this is a graph that shows how many deep learning models are in various code bases at Google and sort of how that grows over from you know, 2012 to 2017 to be about six or, or 7,000 companies. Now, this chart, the end of this chart is five years ago. And so this continued to grow dramatically. And there's a recent update here, which is this rise of generative models is giving Google even more of a motivation to plug AI into everything. And that's what, what is reported here, according to a, a recent Bloomberg report. And so if you're planning, see how you can think about, okay, how can we use AI and ML across thousands of, of touch points? And I say touch points here because one model can power a lot of touch points. You don't have to have one model per touch point. So you're gonna have to most likely deploy several models and experiment with a lot of models which is point number seven. And so you're almost never gonna train one model and then deploy it and then it will work magically. Anybody who's worked with data science knows that there's an experimentation phase. You probably will have to train anywhere from five to a hundred different models until you find the one that really does the best job for your use case. And then you will deploy that. But then deploying the model only, that's also the first step in a future generation of you collecting data to improve the model for the next steps. And so as a lot of people are trying to wrap their head around this new AI economy, these are lessons that a lot of people will learn the hard way, and I'm trying to uh, convey them to you in sort of the easy way. And so point number seven is that you should think and plan and consider for the various descendants and iterations of the various models that you're gonna be using. One of the main concepts of this batch of, of AI companies, uh, of AI models, is this idea of a foundation model. These are models that are trained or let's say pre-trained on a lot, 
a big data set that then can be used to power sort of smaller, more specific data sets. This is a look at how the fine tuning uh, process can be thought of. So you start with an untrained model, and then there's a massive, super expensive pre-training step uh, that builds or results in a foundation pre-trained model. And those are models like BERT or GPT or Roberta or a lot of other models that are, that are used that are then can be optimized a little bit more to achieve the best results for a specific use case. Now, this dynamic of foundation model and fine tune also creates some opportunities. So if you're building something that's on the application layer, so if you're building an application that relies on some models from, from Cohere or from other providers, one area where you can differentiate yourself and just have this protective mode is that you train your own custom models on top of these foundation models. And so that's one way where you can have one, let's say, competitive advantage on the models layer, even if you're in the application layer, even if your company or your product is not something that trains your own model from scratch, but you can start with one of these providers and then fine tune the, the model. And that's what the, this figure here shows. And this also shows the value of proprietary data where you pull it up from the business factors and then you inject it into your tech stack and you use it to fine tune models. And then there's another point about, you know, when you deploy a model, that's not the end of your deployment of AI. That's really only the beginning. Because as users interact with your model, that is extremely valuable data. And you want to design the interaction in a way that captures data and enables you to know where the model succeeded and where the model failed. One example here is Grammarly, so where it gives you suggestions and then it gives you the option as a user to flag bad suggestions or you know, you flag something as incorrect or as offensive. But notice also that even if you don't flag the suggestion, whether you accept it or not, that is a product signal that is also super, sort of super important. And so that interaction between the users and your model are, are very important. And that's a little bit of what this figure shows here. So you have an application, let's say you built your application, maybe you fine tuned a model based on existing data that you have. This is optional, you don't have to do that. Maybe you just you know, built something on top of an existing model and then you served it to your users and then there's this feedback loop, hopefully that you built in and there's some usage data that really helps you understand how users are getting value from your product. Now, two ways to use this data, one is We'll get into it later. You can have a public gallery. So this is especially for image generation models that is vastly useful for image generation. So we'll talk about that in point number eight. But the, the other point, which is even more important, is that you collect that data to improve your models. And so you collect that data and you see how users are, are interacting with your model. And then you use that as feedback. So this is another way to look at it. So what are the, the, the prompts, let's say, that users are sending or what kind of interactions are they having with your application? And so that's a good collection that tells you, you know, what users are looking for in that application. Whether or not the models are able to give them the best results or not, you know, that's one place where you get the signal. But for cases where the model did not give a, a good generation, you can source and just have people label data like this. So you can collect this high value cache of data, which is the input that your users wanted and you know the best output that could have probably been outputted to them, whether it was human generated or, uh, or model generated, but not focusing specifically on how to source that because it, for a lot of companies, that's going to be your secret sauce. But that you source it, that is a valuable collection of data that you gain from that first interaction between your initial product and your customers. Then another thing that you can do there is that you have a new version of your data. So you had version one, which you started with, uh, and then after release, you improve the data that, that you have, and then you can use that to create another or even better model, and then that you source to users. And then this is a virtuous cycle where your product keeps improving over time and your competitors have a hard time sort of catching up to you because you know maybe you launched earlier and you've started collecting this data and 
more and more that gives you more of a, of a protection for this specific data set or for this specific use case. And so this uh, cycle of data is, is an important one and it, it culminates in this figure in the, in the end of the, of the post where you know, I highlight for you different pockets of moats. So you want, and we have the tendency to want the moat to be one thing. Is the moat the model or is it the data or is it the distribution? Really, it's going to be different for many different companies. But for what you want to do for your product is to get as many of these moats as possible. Not one of them is, you know, foolproof or is, let's say, the sil silver bullet that will guarantee your, your, your success. But Think across all of these axes to see how you can differentiate your, your company on the applications level, on the business level, on the models, on the data, and, and potentially the others as well. But what we just discussed, that is the data acquisition and labeling engine, which is emerging as a new factor to differentiate AI-based um, companies and products. Point number eight is about image generation models, which... A lot of the times now they have, they come with these explorable galleries and these galleries are very important for actually using these models. So if you go to mid journey, for example, uh, they have this community showcase. So these are things that are generated by their community and they're absolutely incredible. So they really showcase what kind of results you can get out of this model, but they also enable a new user to get something of value quickly. So I can click on this if I like this, maybe I want a version of this for a hamster or a dog. I can just copy the prompt here and that saves me a lot of generation. So if I was really after generating an image like this, I might have to generate 10, 15 different attempts and not really reach the, the kind of output that I want. But if by browsing a gallery of, of existing ones, um, a lot of the times that even informs me that, you know, maybe that first idea that I had was not good. Maybe this is another um, area that is. So this is a, a valuable use of generation data. And companies like Midjourney are actually building it right into their business model. So even if you pay for these two first plans of Midjourney, everything that you generate is going to go out to the community gallery and people can see the generations that you have. You know, it's useful for the broader community. Lexica.art is another great uh, example of this that is, uh, you know, started with this gallery for stable diffusion, but then they deployed their own model. And then once they did that and they had this homepage with a lot of uh, hits, they sort of started featuring generations of their own model on the homepage, which is sort of a way to nudge the traffic and the people who are visiting from using stable diffusion to using the model here, which is called Aperture that you can just go to generate and then have it generate something for you. And so these were four new points in addition to just observations on AI companies and AI products and what is a competitive moat in this new uh, landscape of AI and some of the things that we've learned over the last um, few years. I hope you find it useful in how you design your company or design your product or how you make use of AI in, in, in the strategy of, of your company or your product or even your skill set. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for watching and then see you in the next video.